My name is Tom Highland. For those of you that don't know me, I have been writing about wine for 20 years uh, for Decanter. I write for winesearcher.com, a little bit for Forbes. Also a freelance photographer and educator. I've been doing these webinars now for the last several weeks. And we have two special guests today. We have from the Chapelet Winery in Napa Valley, we have Cyril Chapelet. Cyril, say hi, wave. Hello. Okay. Just so I can keep you straight. <laughs> I think I can. And we have the winemaker, Philip Corallo Titus. And, Hi, everyone. <laughs> and I love the backgrounds. This is, I mean, if you can't tell that you're in a winery, either you need a lot of wine or have had too much. It won't one of the two, but anyway, so, but this, this should be fun. So to do it with two guests. Uh, this is for both of you, the first question to start off with, but, um, you know, everybody has to stay home these days and this and that, but your your winemakers, your wine producers, you get to go out in the vineyards. How do things look? How's the weather right now? How how are the vines looking? Well, you want me to do the outside part, Philip? And uh, sure, yeah. And you were up here this, today, also. I saw your car. You must have been another blending seminar today. Is yeah, that I I kind of reserve most of my time at the winery for blending in the lab, but it um, you know keeping in touch, in touch, and then doing the rest of the work from home. But that's got its benefits too. Well, so your question was. How's the vineyard looking and how's th things looking there? Today is interesting because we have had a extremely dry month. Uh, so literally for the last month and a half, we've had virtually no rain at all. And yesterday and today, we had some rain, which is interesting. Um, we it kind of, uh, the vineyard is really pushing right now and we had this really warm weather and the vines uh, with our first flowering, uh, was happening the last few days. So not a great time for rain. Um, we don't want to see much rain during flowering because we can get uh, some issues that, that come from that. We get things we call shatter when the right. flowers don't form completely and we aren't able to get them to go to the to complete flowering. And so, but in general, I'd say that this is Quite remarkable but our real challenge that we are very uptight and challenged about is we've had so little rain we've had right around 15 inches of rain and normally a good year we'd have about 30 inches of rain and so um, I um, have made the decision to let my lawn go and not have my big lawn and uh, that'll save a couple thousand gallons a day uh, <laughs> is material at the end of the year um so um so um we're we're actually quite concerned and so the the weirdness of that is me telling you that when it's been raining for the last two days so um we have we could use rain and it'd be okay to get a little more um as long as it doesn't knock the flowers off but in general things are looking quite good now philip's in a different situation because Philip is just started some of his bottling for the 2018 vintage, so he can really talk to you a little bit about what's happening on that wine, and he is blending the 19 wine. So if that's something you want to deal with from the winemaking standpoint, um, he's fully engaged with both of those things right now. Yeah, let's let's go ahead, Philip. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, and the other thing about the weather is. Um, you know, we, we like to see rain and it's good for the environment and good for the, the fish and the forests and everything. But, you know, grapevines, we see a lot of our best years come from these drought years and, and grapevines perform, like you should see these vines. They're so happy. You never know there was a drought and they're just growing like crazy and they're so healthy looking. And we saw that in those drought years of 13, 14, 15 and kind of broken 16 but the the vines actually can produce a really solid crop in those years and uh, you know they don't need as much water as you think you know they're traditionally been dry farmed so they're they can really do well in in this kind of a vintage and you know i know it's not good for many things but at the same time i would expect this this could be the the you know the start to a very high quality vintage so i you know i think we good. have that to look forward to good yeah I, I you talk about the drought years but you had three slash four in a row but i mean after that it gets to you can have a problem right i mean the, the, there has to be enough new, uh, water in the in the soil right for these vines to 
flourish, right? I mean, after four or five years, it's going to be tough, right? Yeah. Well, you know, the, the, um, they need enough water in the soil and then they, then you need this kind of, um, irrigation water to supplement them, especially during really, like if there's a heat spell coming, we like to put down some water and take the stress off the vines. Like if we right. know it's gonna be a hundred degrees or more. Um, so it's the the reserves of water are almost more of an issue than the, um, than the soil moisture because we just need to be able to supplement it. And, and but we've got reservoirs and, and the interesting thing since we built our, our new winery is that we recycle all of our water. Everything that gets used in the winery goes through a bioreactor and gets all broken down and goes back into a pond and then we put it in the vineyard again. So that is a, a huge uh, benefit to, you know, padding our water storage. Right. Are there many other wineries in Napa that uh, have that technology as well? You know, yeah. it's becoming more so the case. And I think that almost any new winery, um, instead of settling ponds and all the other things they might have used in the past, uh, these live systems that um, they're just kind of almost like a um, mini water treatment plant that a city would use, but, but just structured in a way that they're small enough that we can use them efficiently. And uh, quite spectacular what they do and how clean they get the water through, um, through these processes. Uh, of pumping and pumping from one tank to the next and it's right bacteria is working and the whole thing and so they eat everything up and, and it's just it's quite amazing how it allows us to use all that water at least twice so okay good thing good when I, we talk about the renaissance of napa valley you, you refer to robert mondavi building his new winery in 1966 in oakville and then your parents we started this in 1967. I mean, they really were kind of next, weren't they? And um, yeah. tell us that story and, and how, first tell us the, the background of your father, uh, Don, and then your, your mother, Molly, how they came into the wine business and why they moved to Napa and, and what, what, where they found those vineyards, how they found those vineyards, excuse me. That you, um, you led me into quite a bit. You there. can answer so the whole hour, I know, I'm sure. <laughs> Go ahead. Let me just try to uh, get to the, quick synopsis of where this is with kind of cliff notes for everybody. Um, my father uh, out of college uh, with his best friend from literally elementary school started a company that made fresh hot coffee on demand. And basically they, uh, they basically built it, put them into vending machines. And basically at that time, it was 1952, 53, something like that. They, you would basically put a nickel in the machine they would give you a fresh hot cup of coffee. And that was revolutionary at the time and doesn't seem like anything now because everybody's got a Starbucks around the corner sure. and you've got coffee every place. Everybody's got great coffee. But in those days, coffee was uh, pretty bad by the time you got to the office and by the end of the day, the, uh, the coffee was terrible and nothing less than awful. Um, so long and short of it, they started their company. They ran that for about 12 years. It was publicly held. They um, had a division out of Chicago and a division in Los Angeles. My dad ran the division company in Los Angeles. Ronnie ran the division in uh, Chicago. They, they were successful. They were successful entrepreneurs. It was fun for them. They, they just enjoyed the heck out of it. And they finally started getting tired of it after 12 or 13 years. They wanted to do something different. My dad was 34 years old at the time that he bought Pritchard Hill. And so his search for this piece of property really came from his absolute passion because he was in a wine tasting group in Los Angeles and he started to know of these beautiful Bordeaux specifically and he was more of a Bordeaux collector at the time and he was able to buy these beautiful first growths but he decided that he wanted to get into the wine industry but the question now was where do you do it and the one decision that he made was that he wasn't going to go to France to do that he wanted to do it here in California, you wanted to try to find the right spot to do it. So it led him to the Napa Valley for sure in those days. And this is 1965, 66, he started looking and seriously uh, looking at property. And he was able to settle on Pritchard Hill, but that was really driven by a man named Andre Chelichev who convinced my father that 
if he wanted to have the very, very finest grapes that possibly could be in Napa Valley, he had to really look at hillside vineyards. And so that was when his search from the Valley Floor vineyards went to looking at the hillsides. And at the time, there were really no barriers to entry. There were very few people, virtually nobody else competing against him for vineyard land and for buying, buying vineyards. And so everything was really kind of open, long-term families that were willing to sell, short-term families that had bought and weren't sure what they wanted to do. Um, but it was pretty early in that structure when he met Andre Chalachev and Andre uh, convinced him to start looking at hillside vineyards. And, you know, fortunately, you know, luck has a lot to do with this. My dad found the right piece of property. He found okay. a terrific piece of property on Pritchard Hill, which is on the east side of the Napa Valley for those people that don't know where we are. We're kind of outside of the town of St. Helena and up above Rutherford and Oakville, uh, north of Stag's Leap and across from the Howell Mountain District. So we're kind of in this little district of our own where we are here. And um, so that's, that's how he ended up here. And his objective was making world-class Cabernets. Um, and I can tell you that uh, he never looked back uh, from the time that when he first hired Philip in 1990, actually it was the second time he hired Philip, but he, that he didn't have, but Philip was the assistant winemaker initially when he came out of Davis. Um, but Philip can talk to you a little bit about, about that. But um, dad's comments uh, in the last several years that, that he was with us was the best is yet to come. He said, I think you're going to continue making even better, more exciting wines yeah. and vineyards are getting better and better and better. So um, that was really all doing the last 30 years or 35 years that Philip has been overseeing our wine program since 1990. That's great. I, I want to get one question that came up a few minutes before that I just saw, and it goes back to, you mentioned that you haven't had much rain lately. So uh, one of the participants, his name is Woody Thompson asked, he said, how low is the level of Lake Hennessy? What do you think, Philip? I think it's surprisingly high. When I was driving, um, when I was driving down from the winery this afternoon, uh, I was like thinking, you never know it was a drought. It's pretty full. I think it's probably at 90% capacity, but it's, it's a little bit deceiving because um, ironically, most of the water that, you know, that's the water supply, one of the water supply reservoirs for Napa, but Napa gets, and this gets into politics, if we, well, I'll try not to get too political, but uh, most of our water in Napa, uh, Yontville, um, Oakville, Rutherford, everybody but St. Helena gets their water from the California Delta. Um, it, we have the rights to a certain amount of pumping, I think American Canyon as well, pumping from the Delta. So there's a big pipe that comes to us from the Delta and um, that brings in water. And, and then Lake Hennessy is really a, um, you know, it's a backup for our, if they need it. So they keep that pretty full and it looks beautiful because when it's, when it's a drought and the lake's almost empty, it's really depressing. It's not a pretty sight. Okay. Let's, let's go back to Pritchard Hill and the special characteristics up there. What, Philip, I'll ask you, um, if, I don't know how much experience you've had with, with you know, uh, Cabernet from Rutherford or Oakville and things like that, but is there a specific uh, terroir that, that uh, is expressed from the fruit from uh, Pritchard Hill? Yeah, I, I really do think there is, and it's um, it's kind of you know it's it's hard to just say exactly what it is because it changes. You know, I, I think that it's kind of a a range of characters that define the the especially the cabernets or, or really any wine from Pritchard Hill um, that that I think is very consistent, and it's due to the location, and you know, it's I I think it's hard to sort of look at some place and go, oh, it, it is this way because of these five things. And you can say the, the elevation, the soil, the aspect to the sun, um, you know, the uh, being uh, above the fog and warmer nights, cooler days. But it's that what I've seen by being on Pritchard Hill this long is that, you know, when, when, you, when it's a great vineyard, it's a great vineyard. It's just, it's got all the elements that um, distinguish it. And it's not just a great vineyard can't be a great vineyard if it only produces 
you know, great wine one out of three years. Right. It's, it's that consistency that you'd see in a, in a first growth. And that what I've seen that's kind of seeped into, you know, my knowledge of Pritchard Hill is that it's, it's not, you know, it's not immune to problems, but being on the east side of the, the uh, valley, we have so much sun. Our elevation keeps us in this kind of above the fog. We have a kind of a long growing day. And then, you know, we've got these vines growing in uh, one form of rock or another, where it's, is it all rock or just half rock, you know, and some soil. Um, and, and, and so what, what I've seen is that the consistency of Pritchard Hill and the quality of these big, concentrated, really structured red wines that are, you know, they're delivered to us with our, you know, great farming and great winemaking, but, you know, it's this site that just produces this year in and year out. And I've really come to think that, you know, I, I really don't know exactly what form greatness will take every year, but it, it, it comes, uh, it, it comes to us almost you know, uh, every single year, you know, with, with, uh, with very few exceptions. That's great. I have a question here. I, I'd like to get these questions right away so we don't miss them. We have time at the end. Uh, it's from Rick Henry, and this is a little bit about the follow-up with the question I just had. He said, I love Chapelet wines as I do Cade and their Howell Mountain cabs. Can you compare slash contrast Howell Mountain and Pritchard Hill? Philip? Or yeah, way. yeah, I, I, I actually can because, you know, we know the people at Cade pretty well and uh, we, we actually know the people that farm the vineyards at Cade quite well. And so, you know, we, we hear about it and Hell Mountain, it's as the crow flies, not very far away, but um, like they know their soil and their climate like we know ours, but there it's for some reason, Hell, Hell Mountain, be, partly because of its elevation, is actually kind of a cool area. Um, even though we're, we're on very similar, uh, you know, plain and altitude, and uh, I, th I think there's maybe a little more shaded, more forest, a uh, little deeper soils, and their grapes ripen quite a bit later. Like Hell Mountain is, you know, can be they could be harvesting Cabernet two or three weeks later than us. Okay. And, and when it comes to that, I don't envy them. I, their wine quality, I, I'm very envious of because they make such great wines. But to be on that knife edge, you know, into late October and, and possibly November before you harvest um, is, like I say, that's a long time to wait. But in, in a way, those wines, they're, they're similar because their terroir produces these huge concentrated structured wines just like ours but with maybe just a little different emphasis on different types of fruit character or acidity something like that all right thank you let's get into the chapelet wines and the first one i want to talk about i tasted last night and it's in this gorgeous bottle <laughs> molly chapelet signature chenin block and well so that's a wine that's near and dear to our heart um we, when we first bought the property, there were about 35 acres of Shannon Blanc planted in the upper terraces and other spots. And, and over the years, we actually planted more uh, over the year um, Shannon Blanc. And it became a very big and important part of our general business. And we made this lovely, simplistic, straightforward, crisp, high acidity, but beautiful Shannon Blanc um, from vineyards up here on Pritchard Hill. And um, over the years, we started getting economically smarter and we started realizing it costs just as much to make Chenin Blanc as it does Cabernet. Really? And we get about 10% or 20% the price for the Chenin Blanc as we do for the Cabernet. So um, why are we doing this? Well, uh, we, we found out very quickly in 2004. But So from 1968, uh, when the first wine that we made, the uh, first Chenin Blanc made here, to 2004, we had a lot of Chenin Blanc. And in 2004, we tore the vineyards out. We thought, good, we're done. Just lost Cyril for a second. Well, I he did. I, oh, there he is. Here, you're back. I'm sorry. We lost you for about five seconds. You're back. Uh, it was uh, somebody that's from Mexico. For tearing out the, that's what you get for tearing out the Chenin Blanc. Yeah, that was my mother. <laughs> my mother is, is hovering over us. Uh, <laughs> we'll do that again. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> no, so so um, a few years, a couple of years later, my father came to us and said, "Hey, I don't care what it takes. You got to put some Shannon Blanc back someplace." And luckily, our vineyard manager Dave Perio, that Philip was talking about before, who actually losing you again for a few seconds. Hopefully, no more. The deal with that, so I I do know how to deal with that. Watch this. I can make that all go away. Um, so um, he basically said, you know, there's some fairly rich soil right behind the winery. It would be a perfect place to grow a Chenin Blanc. And so he got his brothers, he got it pulled together and he found the rootstock he'd always wanted to put on. And he basically was able to terrace it correctly and trellis it correctly and, and put the vines apart. And they're these great, big, beautiful, um, trellised vineyards that, that really, really arch across and, and, and it is gorgeous and it produces this beautiful fruit and Philip can talk to you a little about the winemaking part of it, but Philip has got it formalized in a system that he's got that just makes this wine so consistent, so lovely. Well, I hope that you enjoyed it last night, Tom. Oh, absolutely. No, I, I love Shannon Block. I remember this is a different producer, but I'm sure you know the story, but Back in the you know the seventies and eighties, there was Shalom from Monterey made this incredible truck, Chenin Blanc, yeah. and I thought, well, you know, this can work in California. Well, why don't we see this more often? And then, you know, you see some of the economics with Cabernet being king, so to speak, especially in Napa Valley. That, like you said, you can only get ten or twenty percent of the price. So, but Philip, go ahead and talk about. Well, the yeah, you know, and and I I'd, I'd have to say it. Um, you know, when I think of Chenin Blanc and I think of Chapelet, it's like we wouldn't be Chapelet without Chenin Blanc. And, and so yeah. I, I think if we ever do, you know, if we don't, we, we don't want to get hit by lightning or anything, if we pull it out, we'll have another vineyard there to take its place this time. Okay. Uh, so we don't have a gap in the production, but it really is part of our, it's almost like part of the Chapelet DNA is to, to make Chenin Blanc. But yeah, and, and it, it is a, I, I, I always say with Chenin Blanc, it's nice to have something uh, that you do that's simple and fun and easy because not everything else is that is that easy or, <laughs> I can imagine, or it's right. much more challenging Chenin Blanc I can't say it makes itself but it's it's the simplicity is the key to the wine and we we have tried many different things in making the wine but we've returned to kind of the old recipe uh, that I inherited which is about half stainless steel fermentation and half uh, barrel fermentation in in uh, neutral or used French oak that doesn't have any real oak flavor, but okay. maybe just a little kiss of oak, but then it ferments in the barrel and age on the lees and gets some of the complexity from the barrel fermentation, but no oak, no malolactic. Um, and so, and it goes into the bottle seven months later. And so it's, it, it, as long as the fermentation cooperates, which it always does, you know, because it's low alcohol and yeast like a low alcohol fermentation, they're not challenged at all. Um, it, it just, it, I can't say it makes itself, but in terms of what we do, it just about makes itself. Okay. And what's the elevation of that vineyard? So let's say right at about 1200 there or. Yeah, 11 to 1200, we're kind of right above the winery. So it's right about there. Yeah. 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 I can imagine that's one of the secrets of why this wine is so flavorful because you're, you're at such a high level. And, and pretty, you know, it's pretty, um, even though it is one of our better soils, it's still a pretty rocky, uh, gravelly soil. And, you know, Chenin Blanc, um, left to its own, really wants to produce about 10 or 12 tons to the acre. And that's, it's like, you know, other things like Zinfandel or Sangiovese, they just, they just want to overproduce. So, um, it, it's a real bloodbath when it comes time to thin this vineyard and our vineyard manager, uh, Dave Perio, and then Andrew Opatz, his assistant, they are, they are just uh, heartless. They just go out there and drop so much of that fruit on the ground and they, they don't feel any guilt at all. I think they used to, but now they know this is the right <laughs> thing to do. Right. We need to get the crop down if we're going to make a great wine. And they'd like to see about five or six tons to the acre. So sometimes that involves dropping half the crop on the ground. Wow. Wow. And, um, you know, it, we used to try and hide it. You know, we were embarrassed that we were doing right. it. But now we're, we're really up front with it. Here's a comment in the chat box. Not so much a question, but I, I'll read it. It's from Malcolm Jones. And he says, I heard that in the 1960s, Chenin Blanc outsold California Chardonnay. Is this true? Well, 
in the Napa Valley, um, it certainly was planted much, much more widely than Chardonnay was in the 50s and the 60s. So um, at one time, uh, Gallo was buying gigantic quantities of all the Chenin Blanc juice or grapes that were coming out of the Napa Valley in order to make their Chablis out of it and do things. So it was very popular. Chenin Blanc was there in the 50s and the 60s at a much higher level. I don't know about California overall, but certainly okay. in the Napa Valley, it had a very, very prominent position. Um, and it, it would grow pretty much any place and anybody could grow it and they could do well. And there was one co-op that most people were members of and they would sell to that co-op. And um, so, yeah, it was, it was definitely a forcible varietal, actually. And last comment on Chenin Blanc, I'm just curious myself as to, do you see, have, have sales been fairly consistent? Is there a little more interest? Is it, in, is it a roller coaster ride? Is, is, is it hot one year? Not hot, but I mean, is it popular one year and it loses a little bit of momentum the next year? Or has it been fairly consistent across the board? Well, I guess I'll tag that one on. But um, so in, you know, 20 years ago when we were making 10,000 cases of it, I could tell you there were certain years where it was easier to sell than in other years it was harder to sell. So maybe it would have been more relevant. Now that we're making about a thousand cases or maybe a little more than that a year, we pretty much have a defined uh, group of clientele who buy this up every single year. And the question is whether we can kind of hang on to it long enough to get into the next vintage to okay. be able to have them all year long. So, so um, we, uh, you know, my understanding is there's a bit of a resurgence and, and there's a lot more people interested in Chenin Blanc now, but we don't have enough to build much bigger of a market for it. So okay. um, those people who know about it, they know what it is and they, and they, and they buy it. So it's pretty right. straightforward. And how many bottles in a typical year do you produce? Or how many cases, excuse me, cases? Well, maybe, I mean, a typical year right around 1,000, but it might be 1,200 in one year and it could be 800 or 700. Okay. Yeah. Right. So. It's about, tw yeah, 1,200 cases is what we'd like. 1,200 cases gets us through one year to the next. Okay. So if it's less, then it's not good. Yeah, right, right. Okay. Let's, uh, let's move to your reds, and you have the, I guess we can call it the flagship wine of Chapelet right in front of you there, Cyril, the yes. Don Chapelet yes. signature, the estate Napa Valley Cabernet. Uh, tell us yes. the history of that. Uh, what was the first vintage of that wine? 1980 was the first vintage that we did a signature Cabernet. We started making Cabernet in 68 and have made wines all the way through. But in 1980, my, my father uh, really believed that that vintage was a better vintage and everything kind of came in the sink. The wine was quite terrific and he liked kind of more of the Bordeaux, Bordeaux pricing model. So when he thought the wine was better, he wanted to charge more money for it. And we had to convince him that if you wanted to do that, he had to do something unique on the label. And so he signed that bottle. And originally the 1980 is signed right down here on the bottom okay. of that a bottle. And then in 81, 82 and 83, he didn't feel that the wine was really up to that caliber uh, to be a signature wine. So those wines went to the quote, the normal Cabernet that we were making every year. And in 84, due to the, some of the vineyard replanting we were doing and some of the vineyard practices, we were doing, we were able to start making it consistently. So since 84 consistently, every single vintage, I believe, was, might have one that we did. Uh, one make one it, wasn't, yeah. 88, wasn't it? Yeah. I think it, um, but I that think that, you know, what, what we kind of started looking at is, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's not a huge vineyard, but it's a, it's a sizable, you know, the, our, our property on Pritchard Hill and that it would, it would make more sense to have quantity very rather than quality and that there was always enough from the property to make this certain level of consistent really high quality wine in any good any given vintage and that um you know much like the the bordeaux model that you have a kind of an integrated system where if something's not good enough to go in the top wine it can go into the second wine or even the third wine and so you know we started really uh, kind of drilling down in terms of what what do we need to make to to really be you know a, a benchmark for Napa Valley Cabernet every year and and that really brought us to the the point that we were blending you know much more um, 
strictly in terms of quality and style and also replanting the vineyards because you know the um the one thing that um you know nobody really tells you you know when you're you see these vineyards is that the only they will live a long time, but the quality doesn't live on for a long time. So, you know, we, we had to, at great cost, you know, starting around, uh, oh, 1989, started replanting the vineyards that were planted in uh, 1964. And so that also added these new vines coming on once they reached maturity, started adding to the quality of that wine and, and also to the diversity of that wine. So now... Sure. Signature Cabernet is, is made from many different blocks of Cabernet. We originally just had, um, the, I think we had five different blocks of Cabernet from the original planting, and now we're kind of up over 30 different blocks of Cabernet as we've expanded the, the not really a little bit expanded the footprint of the winery, but ex, expanded the footprint of the Cabernet Sauvignon and got rid of a lot of things like Chenin Blanc and Riesling and Gamay and you name it that was on the okay, vineyard and right, now it's Cabernet. Um, so we now, you know, to make this wine, we, we don't depend on just five blocks of Cabernet. We have many, many blocks of Cabernet, and then we have three blocks of uh, Malbec and uh, two blocks of Petit Verdot. Really, it's three blocks of Petit Verdot, the way we split them up. And we have Cabernet Franc, and uh, we, right now we don't have any Merlot. We pulled our, our Merlot out, and we're, you know, not, probably not going to replant it. Um, because it just seems like it's a, a better, you know, better suited property for Cabernet Sauvignon and some of the other blenders. Okay. It, the wine is, is blended, as you said, with Petit Verdot and with some Malbec. Has it always been that way? Was it ever 100% Cabernet? Well, back in the day, it, it was, but not for long. It was, I, Cyril, I think it was maybe 68, 69, 70, and maybe 71 that then there was some Merlot planted. And and that's where Napa Valley got started with, you know, blending varieties. They uh, immediately went to Bordeaux and, uh, I mean, to Merlot. And I think that's because it was so widely planted in uh, Bordeaux and, and, then, uh, and then to Cabernet Franc. And, and then so, you know, we were blending these things in. But it was always predominantly Cabernet, you know, like 90% or 95% okay. Cabernet. And the current vintage is 2017, correct? Yes, and the 2017 is denoted by a, uh, instead of the red triangle here on the top, it, it's gold, and that's because it's our 50th anniversary. Oh, great. Okay. So sure. this is a kind of a unique vintage for us. Um, it is, it's the kind of the machine. It's the wine that's out there around the country. You can find it at restaurants, if restaurants were open, that is. Yes, um, yes. And uh, you can find it at retailers. Uh, I like to say that it's a wine that over delivers at a very, very high uh, level. And uh, if people want to have a terrific bottle of wine at a reasonable price, it's a go-to wine uh, to have. And, and so uh, it's, uh, Philip puts a lot of effort and energy into it. He makes it, kind of, he makes it kind of casual, like it's just every day walking down the park, but they put a lot of effort and energy and all those barrels that are behind Philip uh, all speak to their choices of what to end up going into this in order to make this as consistent as we can because those restaurants and those clients of those restaurants are expecting a certain quality of wine. Okay. And um, Cyril, you mentioned before we came on, you, you saw my webinar with Beth Novak from Spotswood and I had asked her about 2017. I said, it, I understand it was a slightly warm growing season and she had sort of a wry smile because I guess it was rather hot during 2017, wasn't it? No, it was, pr it was pretty warm uh, during, during that time. And, uh, but it was a very good growing season and the wines from it have turned out to be quite remarkable. So, um, you know, if it's, if your vineyards are farmed well and you're really conscientious and cognizant of what's happening with the weather um, uh, and you're prepared for it, you can, uh, you, you can weather these things and, and make it work. So uh, we're fortunate that uh, we have most of our own team. We do everything here. So they're, really watching every day for, for those vineyards. Sure. It, you know, it's interesting that uh, Beth, uh, one of their first consulting winemakers was a man named Tony Soder. And Tony Soder got his start here at Chapelet. Uh, and that's where, uh, where he started was here at Chapelet. And he was a graduate of Pomona College. And so was my father. And my father thought, gosh, 
we went to Pomona, must be a good guy, and I'm sure he can make some good wines. As we all know, Tony is a very gifted fellow and, and actually a good friend of all of ours. We all like Tony and, and, and have, and uh, um, so it's great seeing that, that consistency and moving through to other friends uh, like, like it was, and I think it was very helpful with Beth and her mother in creating the spots with brand and the flavors and structures of those wines. Hey, uh, a couple questions here. You had mentioned Merlot earlier, and how you you said you're kind of you're getting away from Merlot, or? Well, you know, um, on our property, and you know, I, I think over time that um, what we found that, you know, like, like I was saying that the original idea for blenders for, um, you know, kind of following in the in the Bordeaux model um, is that. Um, that you would use Merlot and Cabernet Franc to blend with Cabernet Sauvignon. And Merlot is generally thought to uh, soften a Cabernet. You know, you have this kind of low tannin, um, like a little bit lighter in color and low tannin. And, you know, we say it's kind of red fruited and, you know, um, at best we, we like to call it kind of a rum raisin, kind of a sweet nose. And it, um, it really is a nice blender with Cabernet. And then Cabernet Franc, you know, it's more herbal. Uh, more of that tea and tobacco character and and some some floral notes um, those uh, you know I think they're they're great blenders but when we discovered Petit Verdot and Malbec and in the 90s um, we just found like well these are the to, more like the powerhouse blenders these are wines that don't just dilute a Cabernet to make it softer, you know, to adding a light wine to make it, it to make it soft. Um, these wines, uh, like Malbec, has about the same level of tannin as Merlot, but it's got twice the color and, and much more intense aromas. And so you kind of look at it as a, as a winemaker, you think, well, I can add this kind of lighter red fruited soft tannin wine, or I can add this powerhouse wine that just seems to like pump the wine up instead of dilute it. And so that, that's the direction we've moved in. And, and really so has much of the valley. I mean, we're, if you're doing something and you know it's right, it usually means you're on a wave of other people doing the same yeah. thing. And uh, a, a Petit Verdot especially, and then Malbec for many people have become the blenders. And then Cabernet Franc is more like to add like a nuance. Uh, to the wine, that kind of complexity, and and it does have a kind of a delicacy to the tannins, but uh, Merlot has has kind of found it's it. I think Merlot as a Merlot wine is better than say Merlot as a blender with Cabernet. So yeah, we're we, you know we've moved away. We've had a lot of Merlot over the years, and we just think that on Pritchard Hill, our strengths are with uh, Cabernet, Petit Verdot, Malbec. And, and I think, you know, Merlot grows better maybe in the southern part of Napa Valley where it's cooler, more fog, you know, kind of cooler days um, and less extreme conditions. Uh, it holds up much better and makes a, an incredible wine there. So it's maybe just a matter of terroir. And then, you know, it's always our job is to plant what grows best on Pritchard Hill. And, and, and I'd, I'd say we're probably everybody on Pritchard Hill would agree with us that it's it's probably not Merlot. Okay, uh, the reason I ask, I got a question. I have to pardon my look at my at the computer here, but it's from Douglas Rutherford, and he just, I think he believe he's referring to Merlot as a standalone variety here. So he says so. He says, please give us an update on California Merlot developments and how you see Chapelet Merlot fitting in. And he makes a comment here about he thinks it's one of the unsung heroes of the Chapelet lineup, and he loves he loves taking it to a restaurant because it's so works so well with so many foods. It, so just um, tell him thank you very much. Or if he's out there, thank you. We appreciate it. Okay, um, right. um, I th I'd say that, you know, we are consistently making some Merlot and we do have uh, a wine that we make just a Merlot. Uh, and, uh, and what Philip is talking about is that he, he's actually identified other areas where we could get somebody to farm some Merlot or buy grapes from their Merlot vineyard that actually do better and is more exciting and more interesting uh, from a varietal standpoint and more specific to the Merlot than we could do up here. And so our Merlot will be consistent, we'll continue making it. And the, um, 
you know, it was interesting. One movie killed Merlot. All it took was sideways. And <laughs> yeah, the movie, the movie yeah. absolutely shattered all of the Merlot business. Um, we kept going. We never stopped. We still made some Merlot all during that time. Uh, somebody like Duckhorn, which is really built around Merlot, they really struggled for a while. And I think there's more appreciation for Merlot now than we've seen. I think there's continued drive and push for some Merlot. Um, we've continued to have uh, a good support system of people who want us to keep making Merlot. So um, uh, our, our direct customers uh, continue to, to buy it and, uh, and the, some of the restaurants are very supportive of it. So I'd say that it's in good hands. I think it's a lot more stable than it was right after Sideways came out and uh, it stabilized itself. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's something that we look forward to. And I can tell you that it's a delightful bottle of wine and it's really beautiful and it's um, got good balance. And I think balance is a very big, important part of what we're all trying to do when we make these wines. Right, so. right. Well, I, you know, I, I hear Chateau Petrus does pretty well. With Merlot. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, think with, I think with a couple more years, they're, they're going to hit their stride, yeah. Yeah, they're doing pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, that movie came out, what, is it 15, 18, 20 years ago? I mean, at a certain point, you've got new customers that, you know, maybe you've never even seen that movie. Maybe they've heard of it. But uh, if, after a while, it's like, you, you, let's move on. You know, it's like... Yeah. Well, as you know, what what it did for Pinot Noir just set sure. a whole new tone sure. for Pinot Noir in California. So, um, it, whereas it sure kind of cratered Merlot for a period of time, but it pushed Pinot Noir into the forefront. That it, Pinot Noir has never left that you know upward trajectory. That it's that it got front a boost from that. So That's um, true. it's That's true. it's quite interesting. That's true. You know, one of the things that hurts Merlot too is because of that sort of black eye that it got is that people pulled away from it and the it, two things you know the popularity of Cabernet Sauvignon and then and the kind of uh, the uh, depopularization of uh, Merlot is that people stopped planting Merlot and okay. I haven't seen in Napa Valley or Sonoma you know where, where we really work in you know in and out of a lot of different vineyards I haven't seen a new Merlot vineyard I'm thinking 20 years. And really? so um, wow. there's, there's, you know, for to have great grapes, you, you know, things have to renew themselves. When vines get old, they get virused or diseased and, you know, they stop producing quality. So you, you know, we're always replanting our vineyards and, um, and with no new Merlot being planted there, it, it, it kind of like, we haven't seen a really nice, youthful, uh, healthy Merlot vineyard for a long time. And if and if if nobody's going to plant it, it will it'll be like a kind of a self fulfilling prophecy, and right, it'll right. it'll just kind of go away. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I, certainly, you mentioned Duckhorn, and uh, I didn't realize they had struggled, but I could I can understand why. But I'm going to be speaking with Renee on Friday, so I'll, I'll ask her some of these questions, and also what you mentioned, Philip, about uh, you haven't seen any new vineyards being planted lately. So that's it. It'll be good information to find out from uh, from Renee. We're well, I think Rutherford, I mean, I think a good example is I think Duckhorn became very diversified. They, they kind of looked at what other things they could do with Paradox and with the Pinot Noirs from GoldenEye and all the rest of other projects they started doing. I think Duckhorn is doing remarkable. I think they're just, you know, they're hitting their stride. They're doing, making some beautiful wines. Um, so uh, they figured out how to get through that. But I think that, you know, Right, directly after sideways, I think they were rethinking how much Merlot they wanted to make. Okay, all right. So, uh, I, I, that would make sense. We have about 15 minutes left. We've got a lot to talk about. So let's get to another Cabernet, which I tried last night, which was lovely, another 2017, the Hideaway Vineyard. Tell us about that, Philip, tell us about that vineyard. Uh, the Hideaway Vineyard, it's, you know, we have a, a really good map that it makes it real obvious that it's, um, this is a, a vineyard, it's on Pritchard Hill, but when you're at Chapelet and at the winery, you see most of the vineyards are kind of planted around the winery and they're like a kind of a Northwest facing slope. Um, 
and um, and then you think, well, this is you know this is the the property, and then if you get on this little gravel and dirt road and you go, Cyril, I'd say it's a, like a mile and a half, something like that. Uh, By through, road, for sure. Yeah. Through a canyon, and then and then you you drive through this kind of heavily wooded canyon, you 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 pop out on the other side, and then you go to a a, a southwest facing slope. And that's the hideaway vineyard. So that's, um, it's a 15 acre vineyard and it's situated right between uh, Colgan and Continuum, the two wineries. And it's a, it's a very different soil than the rest of the soil that we farm on, on Pritchard Hill. It's, it's shallow, it's extremely rocky and dry. And with the Southwest uh, facing slope, it's, it's, you know, it's warmer there um, as well. And so it's, it's unique, it's a unique growing, um, microclimate on on Pritchard Hill, and it just to us it just screams Cabernet. You would you know we never have even thought as we've gone through replanting this vineyard, we never even considered planting something other than Cabernet because it would you just know it would be a waste. And uh, with this just beautiful red soil and and rocks, and you just kind of these these are proven sites for Cabernet Sauvignon. And so now we're, we, it's been developed now. I think the last vines went in about four years ago and now it's, it's all up and running. And so, you know, we, we, uh, you know, we could all tell a slightly different story, but we all can came to the same conclusion through different, different routes as to like it, as we see, we saw this vineyard um, coming into maturity, you know, we felt, and tasted the wines, you know, the early wines coming off. We used it for special bottlings for Premier Napa Valley or Auction Napa Valley. And then Cyril said, well, could you make more of this? You know, this is really amazing. And now we have a track record of making these small lots. And, uh, and so it was really, I think, Cyril's idea to, um, to kind of single this vineyard out and see what we could do with it. And so that 17 is the is the second vintage so it's 100 percent cabernet all from the hideaway vineyard and uh so it, it it does take us you know in many ways back to our roots of the the late 60s and early 70s where we're just going it alone out there in the rocks and the in the red soil with cabernet sauvignon and it's a pretty spectacular wine yeah i tasted it last night i got very different from the signature cabernet which i thought was more Classic, if you will, Napa Valley with the with the black currant and the, the clove and cigar box, where the hideaway was more to me like like blueberry and black plum and the and blackberry, maybe a little bit of molasses. I mean, a very very different, distinctive wine. Really, really, really stands out. Lo lovely wine, and for seventeen again, a good acidity, very, very very well balanced. Lovely wine. How, how much of that do you make? Well, we uh, I think that was 850 cases okay. in the, in 17, and um, you know that was a, a kind of a smaller crop, even though it was a high rainfall year. But then we got all the the, the warm weather. But it you know those real those heat spells that uh, kind of unrelenting heat spells that we get every three or four years um, takes its toll on the on the the crop size. You know, you get some dehydration and things right. like that. Right. And it's also that we're really, really picky about what goes in that bottle. So there's, there was, you know, much more fruit than that. We could have made more, but it's, it's really like with everything, there's a, there's a quality standard. And, and luckily, you know, I, Cyril never tells me like, no, we need another hundred cases. It's like, you just make the quality and let us know how much there is going to be. And uh, there's never any pressure to kind of produce more, although I'm sure we would like to have more on many years. But uh, it's that really exacting, you know, what goes in the bottle makes all the difference in the long run, because that's what people are going to remember. They're not going to remember like, oh, you made 2,000 cases. They're going to remember how did that wine taste and, you know, exactly. how is it aging. Exactly. Cyril, do you want to add anything to that? Well, the vineyard is right behind our house. And so... Uh, I'm in that vineyard all the time, either walking the dogs or riding our horses or doing something up there. And, um, you know, I've watched this vineyard being redeveloped. Uh, it was originally a vineyard that had some Chenin Blanc, had some other Cabernet in there. And over the years, um, you know, we get better and better and better from a farming standpoint of deciding what clone goes there, what rootstock goes there, what, what 
what works in that vineyard. And I think that's really what speaks to this remarkable quality. Um, and Philip actually has some different choices of throughout this whole 15 acres of vineyard to be able to blend with different blocks of Cabernet um, to make this wine. And, and it's kind of his magic that, that creates that part of it. And, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, it's become one of my real darlings and real favorites, and it's a wine that I love taking to uh, somebody's home for dinner and and, and to, uh, to to try uh, because I think the wine is just so balanced and it's just and a, be a beautiful package as well. Uh, you know, we when we started on to this project, you know, we we worked with um, Madeline Corson, who's a oh, you know, table designer, and uh, yeah, it's a little hard to see, but it's just such a gorgeous um, there label and has a lot of history to it because the the, the background is the um i got uh, one here too. Okay. that's a better one uh oh, right. cyril's is bigger yeah okay. there you go um but cyril could you you, you should, you, you're much better at talking about the history okay. of the, the map on the the bottles oh, I, see, I didn't see the map okay that's neat so the part that goes around the white label is virtually a surveyor's map from the 1860s wow. that a gentleman named Cervantes um, was the surveyor and he all these little lines are either hills or valleys or whatever and and this little tiny red dot right there I don't know if you can see that in your camera yes, yes. Um, that little red dot is actually where the winery sits on that in this area so basically it's a real survey map and and this bottle actually it's it's etched into the bottle so so whereas yours is paper on the bottle that you that you have there, Tom, this yes. is actually etched in. And oh, as Philip said, wow. those bottles turned out so great. We need to do everything like that. And <laughs> the only problem is, as Philip knows, this bottle costs an extra hundred dollars just to yeah. have the etch done to oh, do wow. it. But it's, it is so that's what this piece is all the way around the outside. And so we we literally went to um, our designers and said, Hey, what can we do? to really add this to it. And they came up with this idea and we, we were floating the label on top of it. Now this label is etched too. So this is all um, raised there. But the, the idea was to really speak to the heritage and the property and where this sits in, in the nature of, of where we are in the Napa Valley. Um, and so, so this does have some history to it that's, uh, that's pretty specific and, uh, um, you know, and we're we're delighted to be able to make a wine that's that's this terrific. I I, I would like to have a, a bit more in the future, but that'll only happen when the quality says so. Some years might have a little more, some years might have a little less. And, and as two thousand eighteen, bountiful. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> we okay. got a, a great <laughs> vintage and lots of it. This is being recorded, so it's. It, 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 oh. <laughs> I'll stand by that one. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, yeah. Uh, we have about five or six minutes left, and I do want to touch briefly on the new growers collection from Sonoma. But one other question here, and probably more for Philip, but really for both of you. It's from Arnab, and I'm, I'm sorry if I pronounced this wrong, Ganguli or Ganguli. And she says, hi, from Buffalo, New York. We love your wine. Do you think there is a place for more science in winemaking, or do you prefer to leave it as an art? <laughs> You know, that is, question, uh, right? yeah. it's only taken, you know, I just had my, I just worked my 41st vintage. Um, and so, you know, I've had years to think about that. Okay. <laughs> and uh, you, you start out knowing nothing. So, uh, you know, when you get out of Davis, it's, it's really not a science or an art because you really don't know what you're doing. You're just trying to not make a mistake. Um, and uh, it's more of like calculating your risks. But um, I, I think that where we have evolved, and, and I've always been a little bit uh, reticent to use the term art too loosely, because, you know, I mean, in, in many ways, anything can become an art. Sure. But, um, but I, I don't like to kind of tread on the idea of fine art. Uh, but we use such a combination of, of real high-tech science in both in the vineyard and the the winery and and then but you know that that only gets you so far because it really has to be your sense of aesthetics and then 
you, know, you make these wines, you have to have a very long range view of how they're all fitting together, even when you're in the, the fermenter pumping them over. And, you know, it's this constantly, you know, forming an idea of how this wine is going to be from the very beginning to the very end when you finish your blends. And um, so, uh, you know, I feel it, it, you know, after 41 years, I really do feel it's an art and, um, and it's so much science at the same time. So that's why, you know, I wouldn't want to, you know, rub it in, but I think I have the best job in the world. Um, and I love every single day because we, we are dealing with problems and solving problems and then in the end making something beautiful. Um, so I say science and art, and it's uh, the crossroads. Great. Uh, Cyril, uh, just need a, a 10 second answer on this, or five seconds, from Bob Allison. He wanted to know if that etched bottle is for sale. Um, probably not this etched bottle. But okay. Bob Allison, um, if you give me a call, I probably can find one for you. And uh, don't hesitate, just give, give me a call at the winery. Um, I'm pretty easy to get hold of, everybody's got my number. So don't hesitate, uh, and I'll try to reach out to you too, Bob. Okay, last couple words you wanna say? Well, I'm thrilled that people are willing to join us on, on this, and Tom, thank you very much for inviting Philip and I for an engaging afternoon. Anytime you wanna do this again, just give us a call. We'd love we'll to. Be, uh, at this point, we're here, so we're not going anywhere. So <laughs> yeah, I'll, yeah I'll and I'm here, on. yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, no, this Tom, great. it's great to meet you virtually. Thank you. At, at, same here. I, I really appreciate it. And hopefully I'll meet you in person real soon out in Napa. So. Yeah, do to. that. And uh, thanks again. Thank you. Yep. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.